Hey, Levi and Jenny Lusko here, and we just want to thank you for coming by to watch this teaching from our brand new Compass Rose series. That's right. Uh, this message series is all about us as a church scheming in our hearts how we can be more generous, like Isaiah 32 says, about the generous man who schemes generous things, devises generous things, and then by his generosity, he stands. So we're choosing to set the direction of our compass in a specific way, and that, that way is generosity. It's not a destination we'll ever arrive at, like now I'm generous, but it's something we're always pursuing, how to live Ooh. generously because we have a generous God. Love that. And really our heart is to see Him do more and reach more and to, to really launch out into new spaces and places and avenues where He can reach more people. And that's where this concerns you because the reason we're able to do online ministry as we are and send these messages out and, and all of that, it comes because of the generosity of the people of Fresh Life Church. Right. And so we encourage you to say, as I watch these, I can be a part of it and not just be blessed, which we're glad about that, but we would just encourage you, how could you be a part of this? We would love to send you what we've gave out at church this week, one of these little compass rose kits that includes a, a compass bracelet. And so you can remember some of the things we're preaching about and talking about these four cardinal directions as you're considering maybe how would God have you be a part of expanding the reach of this ministry. We'd love to send you one free of charge. Uh, if you just shoot your name and address to info at freshlife.church, it'll have an envelope in there where you can make a gift above and beyond your normal giving that would say, I am thankful for what God's doing through Fresh Life in this ministry, and I want to help it get to more people. And I believe that that kind of an ownership will cause you to just really feel more a part of what we're doing, mm. and it would be an honor for Jenny and I to partner with you in that way. Absolutely, it's such a joy to get to be here with you today and to get to partner with you. It really um, is amazing what we get to do and what we get to be a part of. And even as we've bumped in to so many of you across the world, really, we've, we've come to understand that it's such a joy to, to know the reach is so far and so wide of what God's doing through us all. Awesome. Well, enjoy this message from God's Word. Well, this is now week three of our series, Compass Rose. And if you have a Bible with you, Deuteronomy chapter 28. And we're going to be in a message that I'm titling Camels and Needles and Spoons. That's the title of the message. <laughs> And I, I was expecting a response to that, because uh, it was kind of a callback, kind of a title. You know what I'm saying? Camels and needles and spoons. Oh That's pretty good. I'm going to call it six out of 10. Uh, but uh, I've been giving a word for the week every single week in this series. And this week, the word for the week is ends. So jot that down, camels and needles and spoons. And the word for the week is ends. Now, of course, there are a lot of different ways you could use the word ends. Uh, like you could say, all's well that. But I want to use it to speak about the top and the bottom of something. Now, all of those three things in my title have a top and a bottom, right? Like they each have an end, like the burnt ends you eat at a barbecue restaurant. Aren't those delicious, right? Or I've been seeing that show up on the menu more, burnt ends. Seems like that would be something that generally would just not be purchased to be eaten. But uh, uh, the ends of, uh, well, let's say, a needle. I got a needle here. The ends of a needle, you have, of course, the eye. And then you have the, 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 the part that rumple stilt skin, hope that sleeping, whatever, <laughs> would touch. And then uh, you have uh, the spoon. The spoon has ends, two ends, two ends to a spoon. Uh, there's the handle end. And then there's the, 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 scoop, the scooping. You scoop with this end of the, of the, of the spoon. And then a camel. A camel has, uh, has a business end that you, you watch out, they spit, right? Uh, but, but then there's also the other end, which is, uh, again, we're back to the scooping. It has to get, has to get scooped. Wait, if you own a camel, they got, you'll scoop what comes out of, out of that end. Um, but, but magnets have, have, have two ends. And uh, of course, a magnet has an end uh, that's a north and an end that's uh, a south. And, and the reason this is, is all kind of coalescing together is because uh, compasses have at the center of them, at the heart of them, a magnet. But it only works because our planet has two ends as well. And I believe that it's within God's heart for us to, to, to care about getting the message of the gospel to the ends of the earth. Anybody with me? Like, let's, let's not keep it to ourselves. Let's, let's broadcast this from the highest mountain to every village, every highway, every, we want to get it to the ends of the, 
or to the north and, 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 and to the south. But in order for that to happen, we got to get the ends in our lives oriented together. All right, so, so that's, that's where we're going to go. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, we find uh, something that speaks about our lives uh, being, being the ends in, in the right way as opposed to the ends in, in the wrong way. And uh, I, I like to boil my, my messages down in just a one sentence. Now, you guys who hear me preach regularly, you hear me do this. This is sort of my way of forcing myself to have a point. Because I think it's possible to preach for 30 minutes and have no one have any bloom and clue what was said. But man, that sounded deep. <laughs> that sounded deep. And, and I, think, I, I think sometimes people think maybe that what we're doing at Fresh Life is not that deep because I'm clear. And uh, you know we, we want to be confused, but really, the, the Bible is clear, and it's plain enough to where a child can understand it. And so my goal is always to preach, not to where you, you walk away thinking that was deep, but to where you, you think that was clear, where you, there was a point to the message. And, uh, and, and so here's my, my whole message just in, in, in one sentence. Ready? Generosity puts a stake in the heart of idolatry. That's pleasant language, isn't it? Generosity puts a stake in the heart of idolatry and opens you up to true prosperity. That's this entire message. Come on, that's where we're beginning. That's where we're beginning, this, this, this idea. So by the end, hopefully, I'll have helped you to see that, that when you act in a generous way, it puts a stake. Like, come on, it impales the heart of the vampire of, of idolatry and opens you up then to true prosperity. That's where we're going to go. Genesis, or Deuteronomy chapter 28, Genesis. Why did I say Genesis? It's the first book of the Bible. Uh, here's, here's what we find. The Lord will grant you abundant prosperity in the fruit of your womb, the young of your livestock, and the crops of your ground. In the land he swore to your forefathers to give you, the Lord will open the heavens, the storehouse of his bounty, to send rain on your land in season and to bless all the work of your hands. You will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. The Lord will make you the head, not the tail. Two ends. If you pay attention to the commands of the Lord your God that I give you this day and carefully follow them, you will always be at the top, never at the bottom. Do not turn aside from any of the commands I give you today. Don't go to the right or to the left, following other gods and serving them. And Jesus, I pray that you would help us to avoid the idolatry that is described here at the end of this passage, the turning off of the path for any reason. Sometimes the compass you put into our hands, it doesn't seem right. It seems like something's off, because the way I feel I should go isn't the way the compass says I should go. Thank you that you've put us on a path in this life, and that a lot of times the the things that would lure us off the the heading you've you've, you've told us to, to head in that would lead us to idolatry, to looking to other things to give us what you alone can give us. And so I pray that we would not trust how we feel, but we would utilize faith to believe in your promise that you do indeed want to bless us, and that following the course that, that you've set us on is going to cause us to be that head and not the tail. And I pray that if anyone with us today or on the internet somehow hearing this message doesn't know you, I pray that you would draw them to yourself into a saving relationship with your son, Jesus Christ. And we ask this in his name. And everyone who agreed said together, amen. Amen. Three myths about money. That's what I want to to spend the rest of our time on. Three myths about money that, that maybe, just maybe, you've bought into at some point. See what I did there? Bought into along the way. Myth number one. It's unspiritual to be rich. I think there's this kind of like idea, especially within church folk, that somehow being rich is wicked, being, being rich is evil. And so we're, we're sort of like supposed to be uncomfortable and pretend like blessing is bad and doing well is bad. And you kind of got to hide that and kind of downplay it as much as possible, right? Have you ever, have you ever kind of felt this? Yeah. Uh, like, like, like uh, here, here's a perfect example. You, you know this, this is what happens in church. Someone comes up to you and says, that's a nice jacket, sweet jacket. What do you do? You go, oh, it's on sale. <laughs> Oh, OK. Cool. Like, 
St still nice jacket? <laughs> and what if it wasn't? Is, is, is it bad? Right? Is, it, is it bad to buy a nice jacket? Is it bad? Why, why would it be that we need to shrug that off immediately? It was a gift. That's super nice. It's a gift, right? Oh, this whole thing. Like we we try and we kind of feel like we need to down. Preachers do this all the time. All the preachers uh, re read a verse like I just read, where God says, "Hey, I want to prosper you," and immediately we go, "Oh, well, we're not talking about some horrible, out of control prosperity gospel where 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 you 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 believe for a miracle and you walk out and your Ford turned into a you know Mercedes in the parking lot, right?" And and preachers like me immediately try and qualify. And, 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 and tamed down and neutralized. Why? Because there have been excesses and people who have basically tried to turn the Bible into an ATM machine, where if you punch in the right combination of verses, it's going to spit out cash, right? But, but do we do this with any other area? Uh, God, God wants to feed you your daily bread. No, I'm not talking about a lot of bread. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but with money, now, are there people who are obese? Yeah, more, more Americans are obese than at any point in history. But some, for some reason, with money, we feel the need to kind of almost downplay it. Do we do it with sex? God wants to bless your married life. Well, not, not too much married, not too much sex. <laughs> like we, well, like, now, how, how, how's, how's the state of, uh, of, of marriage in America? How many people have sex dysfunction and sex problems? And, and yet, in, in this one area, we, we almost have this like discomfort with it, with the notion of, of any blessing from God. So, so what do we believe? The myth, the myth is, listen to me, it's somehow unspiritual to be rich, to be wealthy, or to, to, to prosper financially. That's the myth. Ready for the truth? I'm, not, I'm just going to say it. God wants to bless you. God wants to bless you. God wants to bless you. I thought you'd be more excited about that. Yeah. Like, you, like you, you don't want to be blessed. You don't want a promotion. You don't want a bonus. You don't want your company to grow. You don't want to be recognized by the corporation who owns the company you work for to see the hard work you're doing and bless you with a, a bigger position and a bigger office and more opportunities and the chance to grow a dream that's in your heart as a school teacher, even some side hustle that could eventually become some huge sensation. You don't want to show up on Shark Tank with that idea you invented in your garage. You're, you're like, but I'm, and I'm telling you, God wants you to bless, to be blessed. He wants you to prosper. I'm telling you, God wants you to thrive. I'm telling you, God wants you to find the work of your hands to be blessed. Now, does that look different in different situations? Yes. Does that look different in different fields or industries of work? Is success in one thing always going to be just more zeros added? No, of course I'm not saying that. Nor am I saying that what prosperity looks like in one context, culture, or era of history is the same as in every other way. So we're reading about agricultural. So we're talking about full barns. Some of you don't have any barns, right? I love a full barn, right? But, but, so you, you show up at as, as your, as, as your job, and you work uh, as, as a firefighter, and, and, and the the question is, 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 is full barns good? Right? So all of a sudden, there's grain just falling down into the firehouse. Is that helpful? Uh, uh, clearly, so I'm not, I'm not saying it's always going to look exactly like this or exactly like that. But what is a universal principle is your God has a good future for you and a good hope and a good inheritance. And he wants you to thrive. And he wants you to prosper. He wants you to do well. And it's not unspiritual to want that, too. God put that inside of you. God put that drive inside of you. God put that in, in you to show up at work. And he wants you to do a good job. He is blessed by excellence. And, and when you get the revelation that you're the head and not the tail, that you're meant to be above and not beneath, it changes how you walk into work. It changes how you walk into a job. It changes how you show up. It, it makes you a different version of you when, you when you know, wait a minute, I'm not meant to be from beneath. I'm meant to be above. Because God found me in the gutter. He found me bankrupt. He found me broken. He found me dead. He gave me life. He gave me his spirit. He gave me his power. And what does God do when he makes something, makes it really good? In the beginning, God, right? Yeah. Boom, the world, majesty, creation, Grand Canyon. He gives you his spirit. He gives you his power and says, go to work like he goes to work. Are you going to think small? No. Are you going to do a bad job? No. Are you going to cut corners and be lazy? No. I'm just telling you something. There are managers. There are owners of businesses who are looking for people who are going to show up for work like you're meant to show up for work with a spirit 
appearance that's excellent, like Daniel, that's going to distinguish you above anybody else. Of course, promotion's going to show up. Of course, blessing's going to come. Of course, people are going to recognize the way you approach coding a website, the way you approach leading a team, the way you approach business, the way you approach soccer, the way you approach practice, the way you approach training, the way you approach exercise. It's just going to be different because you're honoring God. You view it as an act, act of worship. You view, view it as something that's pleasing to God, the way you garden, the way you write, the way you sing, the way you sow. And when you really get that revelation that whether you're making jeans or you're building a nonprofit that's going to feed people in Ecuador, that it's an act of worship. Yeah. It causes you to do things differently that by nature, by default, going to cause you to end up as the head yeah. and not the tail. And young people, if you get this revelation, it's going to change how the, 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 the decisions you're going to make while you're young. If you get this revelation that God's got this huge, big plan for me, but I could screw it all up with a, with a drug addiction. I could screw it all up, uh, ending up in prison. I, I could mess this up quickly if I roll with the wrong crowd, if I make the wrong choices, if I end up pregnant at 13. You see what I'm saying? It's going to cause you as the head and not the tail to make some different choices, to carry yourself in a different way. You're going to approach school much as I got to get through this. No, no, I, I want to understand. I want to learn and, and get the tools that are going to change my tomorrow. It's going to change my future. It, it's going to change the decisions you make as far as figuring out, figuring out your passion and identifying a way to get paid to do what you're passionate about. And then, then it's going to help you navigate through the decision of, do I just need a default degree because for degree sake? Or is it actually a skill that I need to learn? What do I need to do to move to the future that God's called me to move towards? I'm telling you, it changes everything when you realize, no, the blessings of God is good, but it's not just about me. That's the kicker. Because God wants to bless you so he can bless other people through you. And that's the game changer. That's the paradigm shifter. Because what, what, what a lot of people are who, who you know, it's just unspiritual to be rich, so I got the sweater on sale. <laughs> Don't worry. Is, is they end up in a place, though, where they're the tail, and they, they're powerless to do anything of the good that they could do when need arises in their life, when need arises in, 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 in the church that they attend or a nonprofit that they hear about, right? I'd love to do something for that, but I, but I can't. I'd love to make a generous gift and, and, and you know, open up, help open up the new church. I'd love to get you know, the gospel into the prisons, but, but I can't because I'm the tail. I just wag along. I, I can't do that. I can't do that because I've thought small. But when you realize, hold on a second, the more God blesses me, the more I can do, the more I can change, the more I can say yes to what he puts on my heart. Now I show up at work seeking to compound wealth, seeking a, bit, a greater return on investment. I'm, I'm seeking to grow this company. Now we don't have to flinch thinking, OK, we're going to branch out, open up this in a couple different states. It's going to get bigger, because the bigger it gets, I realize the bigger the bottom line becomes. Then, therefore, the more I can do all that God's put in my heart to do. All of a sudden now, there's more that I can say yes to that God would put on my heart. And as the head, not the tail, I'll be able to do those things that God's called me to do, because I realize the blessings of God, while he intends them for me, are not just for me. They're also for me to flow through me. And then there's no end to what can happen, because whatever he gives you, you keep giving out. Whatever he allows you to have, you keep passing out. And it causes the world just to get bigger, and you be able to do more and more and more. This is the, the, the principle of Ephesians 4.28. You're right? Because in one translation, it says, did you used to steal? Don't steal anymore. But I like the message translation, because it says, did you used to make ends? See, see, whatever. You guys are the worst. <laughs> Meet by, you're so hard to impress. By stealing, <laughs> we'll steal no more. Get an honest job so that you can help others who can't work. So this is, this, is, this is in one instance going, I used to do this, but now I'm going to get the job. But it's not just for me. It's also for me, for others through me. This is why in Leviticus chapter 19, the nation of Israel was, inst was instructed, don't plow to the edge of your field. You go harvest your crops, you leave the corners untouched. And don't do a second pass. Because in your first pass, you're getting most of it, but then a ton of stuff falls on the ground. Second pass would be to glean. Second glean would be to get everything that remains and leave that field with not a, not a cherry on it, not an orange on it, not a, not a grain of wheat on it, because you went through it thoroughly. God said, don't do that. When you go through, just do your first pass. Don't even do the corners. Leave the corners empty. He said, because he goes, that extra you could save for poor people. Then you could make an announcement, hey, anybody having a tough, tough, uh, tough harvest season? Come on in my field. Grab what you want from the corners. 
And by the way, Boaz in the Bible, there's a whole book of the Bible dedicated to this principle of the gleanings. Because you had a guy named Boaz who was the head, not the tail. And he practiced this, leaving the corners of his fields open. So one day, there was this super fly, newly widowed gal named Ruth. And she showed up in Boaz's field. And I'm telling you something, Boaz, as the head, not the tail, was able to say to his, his lieutenants who worked for him, hey, Throw a little extra grain her way. Like if you're grabbing stuff, just sprinkle a little. That's farmer flirting. That is farmer. I'm telling, I tell you what. You, you throw a little grain her way, girl. Hey, girl, hey. And uh, farmer flirting, right? They ended up getting married, all right? But he wouldn't have got the wife if he wasn't the head, if he had had the scarcity mentality. Give me everything that's coming to me. Or, or this mentality, of, it's not good to be rich. So I don't want to get the, the business too big because people will be jealous. No, this mentality says, the more that God grows this, the more I'll be able to say yes to all this in God's heart. Let's grow it. Let's grow this business. Let's grow this. Man, in Jesus' name, grow that business. In Jesus' name, prosper. In Jesus' name, launch that thing you've been thinking. And don't, don't be ashamed. Any, anybody who hates you, it's just because they ain't you. I'm telling you, they'll, they'll, they'll try and downplay what you're doing and make it seem as though it's not something good because they've given up on their dream. So you walk in the blessing of God and do it with your head held high because it, it is for you, but it's not just for you. Your family should be blessed. Don't, don't buy something on whatever. You see what I'm saying? It's just a small mentality. But, but God's not a scarcity God. The Bible says he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And if that ran out, he would speak more into existence. So, so, so having this finite mentality that, that if I don't eat my dinner, that's bad for people in China, that, I mean, that, is, that is wrong. Do not say that messed up stuff like that to your kids. Them not eating their food doesn't help anybody in Africa. It's never once you're going to mail them that leftover. It's like, that's not, that can't be the level of thinking. <laughs> All right, so myth number one, what was it? It's unspiritual to be rich. Myth number two, this one's a big one, right? Money's going to solve all your problems. This is a big money myth. Money will solve your problems. What's the truth? Being rich can wreck your soul. Being rich can wreck your soul. Now, let's address why the first myth probably exists in answering this one. The first myth that uh, it's unspiritually rich is probably because we recognize that, that money is dangerous, that money can, can wreck your soul. And there's two passages in the Bible that really speak to this. Number one, uh, we, we all know it. It's uh, that money is the root of evil. Have you ever heard that? Someone ever parroted that line to you? Money is the root of evil. The second is that didn't Jesus say a man can't serve two masters? Nobody is able to serve God and money at the same time. Now, let's address both of these. One of those two is in the Bible, and one of those two is not. The first one uh, that I gave you, money is the root of evil, is nowhere to be found in the Bible. That is never said by Scripture. Matter of fact, notice how it's actually rendered. What, what, I, what I gave you is a common mistranslation of something Paul told Timothy as he was giving him advice on how best to minister to affluent people within the local church. He said this. He said, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. OK, that's different. That's a different thing. So is it the money that's the evil thing? Or is it the love of the money that is a root to evil things? That's different. You see, because that means then that money is not good nor bad. It's neutral. It's like a brick. Is a brick good or bad? Well, I don't know. What would you do with it? Well, I threw it through a window, hit someone in the head. That's bad. <laughs> What did you do with your brick? I built a children's hospital. That's good. <laughs> so is the brick good or bad? No, it's you that did something good or bad. So it's not money's problem. Money's not the problem. Your love of money is the root of the evil thing. And what's the end of that thing? One more, one more time, a little look at 1 Timothy. For which, loving money, many, or not what well, he says, some, some, I would, say, I would say many, some have strayed from the faith in their greediness. And what's the result of that? They pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Or as, as, as I said it a moment ago, being rich wrecks your soul. It can, if you let it. That I came across while reading the Washington Post. I was just perusing the internet. All of a sudden, saw this title. And they had me. It was clickbait. I, I couldn't. Because I, look at the headline. This isn't convenient illustrations for pastors.net, right? This is the Washington Post. The headline was, being rich wrecks your soul. We used to know that. 
So I found myself reading this article uh, talking about uh, the effects of, of wealth on us. Now, here's our problem before I even go any further. The problem with that is when you see that title and you think of wealthy, you think of someone else. Not you. That's not you. Being rich doesn't wreck your soul. There's no potential it could happen because you're not rich. Why? Because you know someone richer. You know someone wealthier. And all of us instantly put ourselves into a category other than affluence because where we're at isn't as rich as somebody else. That's how we're trained to think about it. And even when it comes to the subject of generosity and giving, and I talk about giving, uh, many of us, the instinct will be, well, I'm barely paying my bills right now, bud. bud." All right, so if you want to give me some of that offering, I'm a charity cause. but, but, But that's for the wealthy people within the church. But here's what we're forgetting. All of us are, on a global standards, doing pretty good. Matter of fact, they say if you make $32,000 a year, $32,000 a year, you are in the top 1% of the global wealthy. So all of us are doing pretty good on a global perspective. But nonetheless, this article was, 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 was talking about the effects of wealth on the soul, which is something that shows up in the Bible. And Jesus, by the way, did say, no man can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and the false god mammon, which is the, what, what, the, what the idol form of money is. You cannot serve god and money at the same time, all right? So, so, so it's the love of money that's the problem, and it's serving money that's the problem. But here's what the Bible doesn't say. The Bible doesn't say you cannot serve god and make money. The Bible never says you cannot serve god and make a lot of money. It says you cannot serve god and money. You cannot worship god and money. You cannot, with your whole heart, love god and money love money. There has to be a mentality that says money is a tool that I will use to worship God, not an idol that I will worship instead of God. And that ability will cause you to be able to have treasure and and not let it have you. I thought as an example of um, uh, a magnet. So this is um, a putty that's responsive to magnets because uh, it's you can make it at home. It's fun to do with the kids. Maybe you got borax, you have Elmer's glue, you have food coloring because then it makes it look like venom from Spider-Man. And uh, and we took this and we we also mixed in iron shavings. So it's it's little filings like like they would have in one of those little uh, etch sketches. Basically, uh, it's it's just basically little metallic slivers that are responsive to to magnets. Now check this out. This now let's call him. Can we call him? Is it okay to give a name to a, a glob? We'll call him Mr. Globby. Mr. Globby is complete with a set of eyeballs. Can we get a close-up of Mr. Globby? Everybody meet Mr. Globby. There he is. Okay. So this is Mr. Globby here. Now check this out. This is a magnet. And it's a neodymium magnet. Really, really strong. Can you see that? There it is. Sucker strong. Like here's. Okay, that was a mistake. Okay. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. Oh. Okay. Can I check this out? The text said that loving money is what causes you to be pierced through or swallowed up with many sorrows. Watch this. Oh no, Mr. Globby, what have you done? Oh, you're gonna get acid reflux, buddy. That's a mistake. <laughs> OK, so, so, so now back to the Washington Post. What this story tells us, we'll check back in on him later, is that uh, basically those who are wealthy are more likely to commit adultery, more likely to shoplift, more likely to cheat on their taxes, more likely to run red lights and disobey traffic laws, that the wealthy are more likely to take candy that is meant for children, <laughs> that along with Uh, mass amounts of wealth, there is an an upward swing of entitlement that causes people to feel like the rules don't apply to them, and that they're somehow immune to whatever the little people and other people need to to, to follow and listen to. So there's 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 an effect on the soul of of the wealth. And it concluded, the article concluded uh, with with this kind of big idea. Uh, Check it out on the screen. This is from the Washington Post uh, story story I mentioned. Wealth should serve then only as a stepping stone to some further good and is always fraught with moral danger. That's exactly what the Bible says. 
Wealth isn't an end. It's a stepping stone to do something that's a greater good. So our mentality is that I don't want to grow this company for me. I want to grow this company for my life. I want to grow this company for my family. It's a mentality that says, no, there's a calling on my life. That's why God saved me. He wants to use me. I'm meant to be a part of something bigger. And I'm going to grow this company for kingdom good. I'm going to grow this company to do something bigger. Otherwise, we end up, look at this. You can't even see it anymore completely swallowed up by the soul-distorting power of riches. Because listen, when you let riches into your heart, it makes it harder to hear God. You should allow them in your hand, but not into your heart, because it makes it harder to hear God. And I think at the end of the day, we actually end up um, losing sight of the true joy that God wants us to experience. The story that I mentioned, Washington Post article, actually went on to describe that those who are uh, wealthy have a higher rate of loneliness, and even it's been linked to higher rates of suicide. Now, how crazy is that? To think, I'm not happy now, but if I had this, I'd be happy. If I had that, I'd be happy. I'd be more generous if I was wealthy. Actually, uh, the proportional rates of giving drop the more money you make. So you're likely to give a lower percentage the more money you have. Why? Because oftentimes, we think the money will change us. And I'll be generous if I get this. I'll start being generous then. But when you've already let money into your heart like that, no matter how much more you have, it doesn't change you. It just makes you more of the same. So you, what, you, what you start with, you'll stay with. So if you start with generosity on a small budget, that can stay with you over time. You can stay generous over time. You can stay generous over time. But since wealth is so distorting and so messes you up, it, it, it can. It, It'll, it'll just cause you to become more and more inward focused, not less and less, the more that you have, swallowed up with, with many sorrows. How telling is it that we live in a day where obesity is, is skyrocketing? We have more to eat. Uh, entertainment choices are skyrocketing. There's more to watch. Have you, how many hours have you wasted on Netflix trying to pick what to watch of the 1,000 things that are there? Amazon Prime Video, Hulu, there's so much to listen to, so much to watch, and, and we don't even know what to do with it. Uh, anxiety um, and medication is skyrocketing. Depression is skyrocketing. And, and here we have the ability to travel uh, the world. We have the ability to, to watch whatever we want to watch, to eat, in many cases, whatever we want to eat. And yet there's a despair. Uh, theologian Ravi Zacharias commented on this when he said the following, I'm absolutely convinced that meaninglessness does not come from being weary of pain. Meaninglessness comes from being weary of pleasure. And that is why we find ourselves emptied of meaning with our pantries still full. What's the answer? The answer is we have to fight to hear God, fight to follow God in the midst of what we're facing. This is why Jesus said once that, uh, this is in the, the Gospels, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye, look at this, of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Now, you, 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 as a visual, think about this camel here. And think about this needle here, trying to get no, I'm not sticking the needle in the camel's eye. I'm trying to stick the camel through the needle's eye. Think about how impossible that is. And this is just a tiny little toy, not a full-grown camel. And, and some have tried to say, I don't know, Jesus meant uh, there's this gate in Jerusalem called the Camel's Eye Gate. That was his nickname, because it's not on any map. It was a nickname, Camel's Eye Gate. And the camel could go through it. He just had to stoop down. So if you don't stoop down, you, that's not what Jesus meant. That's not real. Someone else said, oh, no, no, there's a special way of making thread with the camel's hair. It's really coarse. So you can get it through the needle. He's got really stuck on it. And then you can really get it. That's not what he meant either. Because in the Greek, when he says camel, he means camel. <laughs> when it says eye of the needle, it means eye of the needle. So, so again, if you look at that verse, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle and a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, context is everything. Because he had just been speaking to a young man who was wealthy and religious. And he thought that both of these things gave him a leg up on anybody and get into heaven. And Jesus knew that this guy didn't just have money. The money had him. And uh, it was, for him, was greed was the big problem. And greed is the most subtle sin. And that's why it's the only sin Jesus actually said, watch out for it. Why? Because it's the only thing you can be doing, but not have a clue you're doing it while you're doing it. Not so with adultery. Oh, wait a minute, you're not my wife. I said, no, you, you know, right? You know while you're stealing. You know while you're lying. 
But when you're committing a sin of greed, it can blind you to even see it, not to even be aware of its presence. And so it distorts things. It changes things. I, I was thinking about how you can take a needle, and I got a bigger one here. You can take a needle. You know this, right? And you can, you, you, all your wildlife survival type people, you can rub it on a magnet 50 times. And you can actually magnetize a needle to where it becomes a magnet. And then you could put it on a leaf or as I have here, on a little piece of cork that floats, anything that floats. And you take it, and you put it into water. And if you carefully put the, the magnetized needle on the cork, it'll eventually find its way to pointing north. And I've got another compass here. And you, you'll see, if you do it right, eventually, both needles will be pointing in the exact same way. So you have basically here uh, a compass. Now, here's, 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 the, here's the rub. If I can get Mr. Globby out, look at this magnet. We, oh, gosh, it looks terrible. Buddy, if I take this now, look what happens. It's not tracking with the Earth anymore. Look at my little compass. You see that? It's like Jack Sparrow now. Where are we going? Where are we going? Because uh, here's the thing. They can't track with the Earth because it's paying attention to a closer compass. It's paying attention to a closer magnet. It's, it's just messing with it because that's what it's reading now. And that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying it, it, it's impossible to love God while you're busy loving that money. So he called that young man. He called that man out and said, because the guy goes, what one thing do I need? Because he, he was still lonely, still empty. He goes, I've done all this, but what do I do? Jesus goes, oh, easy. You just take all your money, all your, all your money. Oh, gosh. All, these magnets are going to kill me. They're just everywhere. Um, if you just take all your money and uh, make a huge offering to feed the poor, use it to, to do some powerful good, and then, then you'll be able to follow me. Now, what did he not say? He did not say that guy could never make money again. Didn't say he couldn't work again. He was calling him to a, a ridiculous, uh, crazy sacrifice in the moment. Why? Here, here we go. Because he knew that the prosperity that God intended for us all to walk in had become this man's identity. And when prosperity becomes your identity, it's turned into idolatry. And that's why he calls for generosity, which is the one thing that can then open you up to true prosperity, which is doing good with God and walking in his plan for your life. I'll say it again. When your prosperity becomes your identity, it's turned into idolatry. And what's called for is ridiculous generosity that will then and open you up to true prosperity. Because if I work hard, I can extricate the, the, the wealth from, from around the heart that, that it is. I mean, it's not easy. And you got to fight it. And I think that's why God calls us to tithe every single time we get paid. I think it tears away a little bit of that money in our heart. You got that paycheck? Don't let it into your heart. First 10% back to the kingdom. It's not mine. It's been given to me. I was bought with a price, the blood of Jesus. I'm a heart set on heaven. I'm headed for home. This is good. This blessing is good. But it's not for me. I don't want to let it in my heart. Every time you get paid, it's a little bit of a sticking to you. OK, first 10% back to God. I think that's why God calls calls us to be regularly practicing generosity so the wealth doesn't become our identity. We're putting a stake in the heart of idolatry. I'm telling you, it's every single little time. You don't start when you have a million dollars. You'll never be, never be able to give that $100,000 check. You start when it's $10. That first dollar will be hard. It's one little grain of sand at a time. And pretty soon, God can trust you with more because our hearts are clean and our hands are pure. We're not lifting them up to an idol. We're walking with Jesus. We're fighting off that idolatry that is so so easy, that's so deceitful, that's so subtle, that sneaks up when we're least expecting it. And as we fight to keep that, that magnet free from the, the riches that God wants us to be able to have in our hand, but not have in our heart, we can avoid the outcome of the rich young ruler. It's harder for a camel to get into a needle than a rich man if that's his identity of rich man. You see, because the moment you make an offering to God, what you're saying is, this isn't me. And this isn't mine. Everything I have is a gift. I know some of you push back on that. I worked for what I have with hands that God gave you, with breath that God gave you, with skills that God gave you, with the country you were born in that God gave you. We could have been born in outer Siberia, OK? None of us grew kidneys in our garage. All of us are, 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 are God-made men and women, right? So, so this young man, that was too much for him. He couldn't do it. He couldn't let go of my precious. And the Bible says he went away sorrowfully. 
And it uses the same Greek word sorrowfully that's used of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus contemplated being cut off from God on the cross. The Bible says Jesus grew sorrowful. Why? Because what God the Father was to Jesus, money was to this young man. And the only thing that could cause him to, to have his heart linked up to God would have been that, that generosity in the moment that would have broken the power of greed by putting a stake in the heart of idol worship and allowed him to be positioned to actually be what he was born to be, the head and not the tail. And that's why we looked all across the New Testament to examples of righteous rich people who used their good for kingdom good, like Phoebe who funded Paul's ministry, like Lydia in Philippi, who, who, who's like the Ralph Lauren of the, of the New Testament. She funded Paul's ministry with her garment business, using the passion in her heart to fund the kingdom of God. You, you see uh, uh, Theophilus, who, who used his wealth to pay for Luke to write the book of Luke and the book of Acts. We see Lazarus, Mary, Martha, who had a huge house. Is, were they embarrassed of it? You never see one moment of cringiness. Why? Because they allowed Jesus and the 12 apostles to sleep at their house. If they had a studio apartment, because that was more spiritual, they wouldn't have been able to stay there. You have so many uh, in the Bible who, unlike the rich young ruler, didn't use their wealth to do the kingdom of God. It was in their hands, but not in their heart. All right, so, so that's the, the second myth about money, that uh, money will solve your problems. Uh, Biggie was right, after all. All right, so, so third, third myth about money. And this, this, this one, I think a lot of us tend to believe, and it's if I don't look out for myself, no one will. This myth says, if you don't look out for yourself, no one will. It reminds me of the card game Spoons. You know, when you have these playing cards that you pass out, everyone's got, you know, four, four of them, I think, is how you play it. And, and you get past a card, and, and you have to put one down. And you're trying to get all these, these four cards to, uh, to, to, to be the same. And if you can successfully do that, then what do you do? How is it in your family? In my family, it's you slyly as possible. <laughs> Grab a spoon. And you won't even know that you've got it. Why? Because there's one less spoon than people playing. And, and the next person's going to go like this. <laughs> <laughs> and eventually, it's going to be this crazy melee. But you want to avoid that as long, and keep them playing like idiots as long as possible, even though a spoon's been taken. Right? Is this Christmas at your house? And uh, we've been playing with our girls, and it is, yeah, I highly recommend. Turn the TV off and play some card games. You know what I'm saying? It's just really good interaction. It's really, really fun. And, 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 and I think everybody, at cer a certain point, grabs it because they all know there's, there's, there's not enough to go around. And so I got to grab what's mine. I think sometimes we're that way with finances. And that's why we make the mistake of being the tail, not the head, when it comes to money. What do I mean? I mean, many of us, we approach money this way. Live, save, give. And this is the, the, the financial planning of the tail, of someone who's beneath, not above. First thing they do when they get resource is live. This is pay the mortgage. This is pay off the student loan. This is, this is pay a little bit towards MasterCard. This is AT&T because priorities. This is Netflix because see before priorities. This is, this is food. This is going out to eat. This is going on a trip. This is buying clothes. We live. We get money. We live. We get money. We live, which is spoon thinking. Give me my spoon. Give me, give me my spoon. Give me, give me my spoon. And then we know deep down we should save. We're probably not doing as well as we should, but we're saving something. Maybe corporate uh, helping out. We set something up with accounting to where it already happens about us seeing it. Because if we did see it, it would go to the first category. A little bit maybe towards the 401k, but we're not going to see that for a long time. So we're not doing what Proverbs says, which is saving and thinking about the future. And like the ant, knowing that there could be lean times coming. You could get injured at work. What if, what if this happened? What, so having that three to six month uh, emergency fund or whatever it would look like, we're not doing that. Uh, but, but if we are, it's a little bit. Bit. So that's, but that's a priority, at least. We all think about it, even if we don't do it. Live, save. What's the third category? Well, if there's anything left, well, sure. We, look, we've got to give something. Uh, like, oh, my gosh, there's an extra 10 in my wallet. You know what, God? Here you go. Here you go. This is a little bit left. You know, what, what, what's needed to get to the tax thing I need? So it's, it's an afterthought. It's an end of the year thought. It's, it's you know, it, OK, here you go. It's, it's after I've done my living and after I've done my saving, now I'll approach and actually ask the question of well, what should I do with the, with the financial giving? And this is tail thinking that puts us first grabbing the spoon. But what does this lead to? Well, in the Bible, there was, there was, um, there was some people who were approaching it this way, living first and, and putting God last. And, and God spoke to them through a prophet named Haggai. And notice what, what God said. He said, you have planted much, but man, you guys are harvesting little. You eat, but you never seem to have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. 
You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. You brought home, I blew away. What you brought home, I blew away. Why? Because of my house, God says, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with his own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew, and the earth its crops. God said, I want to bless you, but the way you're living as the tale doesn't allow me to. You know, they say that your chance of, of thinking about suicide goes up if you make 10% less than people in your neighborhood do. They've actually tracked this. And uh, so this, if, if you put yourself first, you're always just going to look around and see other people who have more. And it's going to lead to that meaninglessness and despair. And you, you'll not be the head. You'll not be from, from above. But here, here's the cool thing. I, I, I got this little toy. And it's called a mag switch. And it allows a magnet. Now, check this out. This is, let's be really careful, off. OK, so check this out. Uh, as long as I have it in the right orientation, if, if we're on our own uh, trying to lift up what, what God's called us to do, we'll never be able to do it. We end up like those in Haggai's day. We're putting ourselves first, and God's withholding the actual prosperity he wants on our lives. But when we flip it, because a magnet pulls different when it's upside down. Look at, look at the orientation it's meant to be. Instead of uh, live, save, give, it's look at it, flip it. It's give, save, live. This is where God wants us to live, where we're putting him first. Whatever, uh, whatever that looks like, every single time we're paid, we're, we're putting God first in faith. We're putting God's kingdom first to fight off that idolatry and that identity rooted in prosperity. And then secondly, we're saving. We're aggressively saving, because we're going to make better decisions once we've given. We're going to think about the future. We're saving. We're, we have a plan for it. And then lastly, we're living. So after we've done our giving and after we've done our saving, then we approach living. And it's, it's, it's a lot of times going to mean we're not going to do sing, some things right now we'd like to do. We're not going to keep up with the Instagram. We're not, oh, oh, the neighbors went on a trip. Oh, oh, this is what you got to do. Is it any mistake that the Safari icon on your iPhone is a compass? Because I think a lot of times uh, we're kept from following the direction God wants us to go by the compass of what we see on the internet and keeping up with our friends and all of that. But we'll never be able to be positioned to do all that God calls us to do with it as live, save, give. We got to flip it around. It's, it's a different end, like that compass. And check this out. With this switched on, it's pretty powerful, because then you'll be able to do all that God called you to do when you get it flipped around. Come on, somebody. We got to do things God's way. It'll be, it'll be harder in the short term. But in the long term, we'll be able to say yes to all that God has been dreaming of for our lives, the great weights he's called our church to carry, the gospel. We'll get to the ends of the earth. I'm telling you something. If we have it going in the right direction, which gives the polarity and the pull that God wants us to. And then instead of grabbing for the spoons, I think God will allow us to become the spoon. Now, Neo said, there is no spoon. I got one right here. And here's what's cool about this spoon. Let me show you a little close up. It is made out of 500 little magnetic balls. Now, check this out. That by itself is not super significant. But when it's attached to, see that? When it's a part of something bigger, it becomes something special. So this spoon, to me, I feel like is all of us approaching it, give, save, live. All of us. Not any one of us on our own next weekend in this offering are not going to be able to do all the things that God's called us to do. But if every one of us will realize, if I build God's kingdom, he'll build my life. I don't need to grab the spoon. I can be the spoon. I could be a part of the spoon. Some of you, that's going to mean a, an enormous gift next weekend to what, what some of us could never give. But others of us, it's going to say, of what I have, I will not miss out on the opportunity to be a part of this. I will not miss out on the chance to say that what God's done in my life, in my family, and what God will do in our future and we will be able to be fashioned into a spoon. Now, why would I pick a spoon of all the things? I get the camel. There's one of those in the Bible. I get the needle. You have to have a needle inside any, any compass. And the camel had to go through the eye of the needle. So well done there, Levi. I'm sure, I'm sure some of you are thinking, because of all the hard work it takes to come up with crap like this every single week. Um, <laughs> but somebody out there is saying to me, why a spoon? Well, aside from the fact that we play the card game spoons, and it's a gimme to grab for me mentality, I did a little research and found out that the first compass ever recorded in history was in China 2,000 years ago. You want to see a picture of it? 
It's a spoon. A magnetized, self-seeking spoon is the first compass ever used. And I love that because it's the opposite of how our compasses work today. They say north, this one said south. And I just wonder what could happen if every one of us would be one of these little magnets coming together with our gift, with our sacrifice, with our telling God what, what it means to us that he's worked in our lives salvation, that he wants to use us in the future, that he wants to bless our homes, bless our lives, and send the rain on our fields to say, I want to be a spoon, pointing the way, a different way than our culture approaches it so that more people who are far from God would be filled with life in Christ. May, in Jesus' name, we all become the spoon. Amen. Thank you so much for watching this teaching. Exciting to be in this Compass Rose season. Uh, you can go to freshlife.church and through the Give button, even now, find Compass Rose in the drop-down option and be a part of this as we move towards this year end with a heart that says, we want to see you do more. Mm. We, we want to see you reach more. We want to live with our hearts set on heaven. Yes. And the best way to move that needle is through our generosity. God bless you guys.